please enjoy. Thank you very much, Diego. And uh, thank you for taking us through these next 57 minutes of uh, reading and learning. Um, Creative Business Network actually runs also a competition called the Creative Business Cup. It, is, it has existed since 2012. And a couple of years ago, we had an Italian startup come to uh, Copenhagen and pitch their idea for a social reading app uh, called Bedwell. And it was Eduardo Montenegro who was um, here in uh, Copenhagen and was pitching. And I have since met many investors that were impressed by your pitch. Uh, I've asked you to co-host this webinar. Uh, it's always good to recognize that someone else knows more about the subject than yourself. And um, you will uh, give a small presentation and then uh, pass on the word to the other presenters that we have today. Uh, you have it in your program, but I can maybe just uh, repeat that we have, besides uh, Eduardo Montenegro, we also have Elena Bonifaci from Pearson. We have Katja Aladin from 100, the innovation network for edtech startups. We have uh, Aya Runge Holmeko from Alinea that has made the Sofa School together with Josephine Jack Ivey. Josephine Jack Ivey was not mentioned when we sent out the invitations uh, yesterday, but she has been working for the last 15 years uh, as a consultant and a speaker uh, around uh, education. And she has been the one that's been responsible for the development of the SOFA school. So just sit on a sofa and you'll learn just like we can today, actually, if we want. But uh, now, Eduardo, the floor, the screen is yours. Thank you, Rasmus, and uh, uh, thanks uh, to the CBN for hospitality. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, I'm very happy and uh, uh, I feel home because uh, I'm meeting a lot of friends today and uh, I think we desperately need it during these days, so thank you. Well, uh, how about reading and learning? Um, I would like to start from evidence. And uh, actually evidence is that uh, students and young people uh, today spend from six to nine hours per day on the internet. So the big question is, uh, is there still time to read books? And uh, is there still time to uh, work with uh, long texts and uh, critical issues? Which is, I think, extremely important for uh, us as human beings and uh, for our societies. Well, I am very positive about that. Um, first of all, I think that uh, uh, when we say that reading is important and when we insist on the rhetoric of the importance of reading, we fail. Because reading is, first of all, a pleasure and uh, all we can do is try to make reading more and more exciting and uh, happy as an experience, as a learning experience. And uh, up to a certain extent, uh, we never read so much as today because digital technologies are extremely helpful to promote reading. Basically, smartphones are reading tools. So we are reading a lot today. I think the problem is uh, what do we read? And uh, how can we use technology to force the reading? And uh, in order to solve this, this issue, we must remember that readers are smart and intelligent. I mean, readers often choose and always choose the right tool for the right content and time. So uh, the main issue is trying to develop new content for new readers using new digital tools. Because today, most of the literature we have has been written 200 or 100 years ago. And so uh, it does not, uh, I mean, it's not that easy to read a 500 pages novel on a smartphone. So contents are changing slowly, slower than technology. But it has always been like that. And uh, uh, if 
15 or 10 years ago, we thought that ebooks would have replaced paper books. Today, we are much more aware of the idea that uh, reading is hybrid. I mean, we both read ebooks and we also read paper books. There is also an interesting book that uh, I would like uh, to recommend, which is Words on Screen by Naomi Baran. It has been published in 2015, but it is still the main text if we want to understand how technology and reading interact with each other. And uh, last but write, not least, uh, if, sorry. if you can write the title after your presentation, you can write the title in the chat so people can. Yes, definitely. And uh, last but not least, I would like to remember that reading is a social experience and learning as well is a social experience. So the more we read books, the more we like to go to libraries, join book clubs, and comment on books together and share this experience. In the past, people used to spend time sitting around the fire, listening to old stories. Today, we use technology to share our feelings about reading. This is why our core activity uh, with Betrill is to merge and uh, intertwine reading with social networking. Because we think that the power of technology is about uh, enabling people to join each other and to share the views, either they, if they read on paper, on ebooks, on any other digital tool. So basically, these are my, my main takeaways, my main points about reading. But uh, now I would really like to listen to the other participants to this webinar, starting from uh, Elena which is a friend and, uh, and a partner for us with Betrill because together uh, we are developing a new reading app. And I can maybe add that uh, Elena is from Pearson and Pearson was nominated one of the most innovative companies uh, a couple of years ago, you know, innovative companies in the world. So uh, you must really be in the forefront of what's going on when it comes to uh, reading and education and learning. So oh, thanks, thanks Eduardo, thanks Erasmus, and thanks uh, to all the network and to all the people that are here to listen uh, to, our, uh, to my and Pearson experience today. Uh, I confirm that yes, Pearson is uh, working a lot uh, on innovation. Uh, Pearson is uh, a big company, one of the leading company in the world working in education. Uh, I've been working in Pearson since 2004, so also my experience is, uh, my professional experience is all around uh, education and the world of education is changing a lot. Um, when I started to work, uh, this was not the general scenario. Uh, now a lot of things uh, are changing because uh, um, I think uh, it's time uh, to bring, uh, um, to connect the school to what is happening in other uh, environments. So thanks again for hosting me. Uh, today I'm here because uh, uh, as Pearson, we are a partner of uh, uh, Betwill and uh, so we have known Betwill, uh, not so, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> just a moment, I'm trying to share my screen and I'm not going to speak in the same time. Okay, so the idea uh, in uh, working with Betwill uh, that uh, was really uh, in Italy uh, one of the most interesting uh, educational startup uh, that uh, we met uh, was uh, try to uh, bring in the educational context, uh, so in the school, uh, the social reading experience. Eduardo explained very well what is uh, social reading or maybe which is the aim of social reading. When we have looked to the experience of Betwill, uh, we were quite astonished because uh, they were able to bring innovation uh, starting uh, uh, from uh, uh, the work uh, with uh, teachers and students. So starting um, from the real experience in the classroom. And so we tried to provide uh, uh, our support. Uh, obviously, we, Pearson is a publisher and now this publisher is trying all around the world to become an educational company. It's not simple. Uh, we work in more than 70 countries uh, all around the world, so we have an international perspective. Uh, but I have to say that something uh, similar to Betwill uh, was new, also for us. Uh, and so what about what happened? Uh, social reading in the classroom 
uh, is something that uh, brings uh, immediately uh, interest, uh, not just in the teachers, but also in the students. What are the main points that uh, we address when we speak about such a reading and when we activate this kind of experience? Uh, there are a lot of, po lot of points that we can activate that became immediately advantages in terms of didactical and educational experience. First of thing, and it is, this is, I think, the subject of this webinar because we are speaking about uh, reading, learning, and educational. Uh, you know that reading, as Eduardo said, is a spontaneous activity. Uh, otherwise, it's not simple to read if you are not uh, interested. The way in which uh, the such a reading uh, is proposed uh, can become uh, a powerful uh, tool for, spontaneous, for uh, moving a spontaneous interest in reading from the students. Because they meet for the first time uh, reading in uh, um, a different environment that is near to their experience. So reading in a cell phone, like for instance the Betwill app, reading in an informal environment can support uh, an experience that is really different compared to reading in class uh, uh, with uh, just uh, our course book. Then there are uh, another important point. Uh, reading means developing skills, but which skills? Uh, as you all know, who I, I guess someone of you work in education and works in education, and there is a lot of debate about knowledge and skills and the relationship between the capability to develop knowledge, but also the need that we now have to develop in our students, uh, the, in particular the cross skills, cross curricular skills, transitional skills that are uh, that the current model of society uh, is asking them. For sure, to read, to have this kind of experience means also uh, capability of developing different uh, skills. Yes, the literacy one, but also the digitals. Uh, the, the, um, and uh, uh, the soft skills that, are need, that you need when you speak with other students. Uh, then an important point is reading literacy and digital literacy. Uh, as you probably know, reading that doesn't mean just read the text, it means also to be able to um, to start from the reading and uh, uh, to be able to um, develop uh, different experience speaking with others, uh, connecting with others about what you are reading. Um, the app, the social reading experience, means also to be able to share your comments with other readers. And this motivates students and, and enable a different process. Obviously, this is also a way in which you work in the student's environment that is really, really near to them, but you also are able to uh, educate the students to use uh, uh, critically the digital environment too tools, so uh, you develop digital literacy. Uh, in terms of reading, uh, reading uh, with the social reading uh, means also enhance the reading experience uh, in the sense that uh, you are in an environment in which not only you have a social uh, uh, sharing of, of your experience, uh, but uh, uh, you can uh, provide to the students a uh, uh, lot of didactical support uh, in terms of uh, questions that can uh, enable the students to understand better. Obviously, to develop also digital citizenship, as I was saying before, because uh, uh, this is a way in which the relationship is uh, organized and uh, guided, but uh, uh, you develop your capability to be in relation with other people. Uh, in our experience, and I will show you in a while, in a, in a, in a moment, uh, this uh, such a reading experience means that the students are able to read the text, not only with their class, but with a lot of classes all around Italy, in our case in Italy. This means that you are in contact with a lot of people uh, for the first time, because this is not uh, the uh, normal experience when you go to school. In general, you meet just uh, your classroom mates. And so uh, this means uh, also to be able um, to educate the students uh, to digital citizenship that for the teachers is really important now, but also for the families in general, for everyone, this is a big question. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, finally, but it's really, really important, uh, we need to understand that, that this is a way in which uh, uh, we develop inclusive uh, education. Uh, inclusive, I think, is, inclusion is one of the main 
uh, objective in uh, this uh, specific moment. Uh, and uh, um, I think that uh, the idea is that uh, we don't give to everyone the same tool. We give different tools. So the social reading experience is a tool that uh, uh, enable a personalization of learning and everyone can reach the same objective, that is the real inclusion. So uh, thank you, Elena. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt because no, no, uh, you mentioned inclusion in education, yeah. and I think that uh, uh, this is an element which uh, relates us deeply to the activity that uh, uh, Katia Haladin from Andred oh, has been well. doing. So I would ask Katia, so we, we can come later to, 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 yeah, to social yeah, yeah. reading. Uh, because I think that uh, two elements are important in Katia's experience. Uh, she's a researcher for hundreds, so she has the opportunity to witness many different innovation in education in different fields. And at the same time, she's been living in Finland, uh, which is a country where libraries are, are at the core of uh, how society works. So I would like to ask Katia to introduce her um, background. Yeah, sure. I would love to. Should I start my presentation or? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Perfect. I will just share my screen. There we go. And play. Wonderful. Can everyone see? Yes. Lovely. So thank you so much. Um, my name is Katija and I do work as an education specialist and researcher at 100. I'm really excited to be speaking with you today because my background is in elementary education and primary school and early childhood. So really interested in the concept of reading and learning and innovative ideas that come along with that. Um, one thing that I'm just a little bit about me, I'm fascinated by different education systems and having taught in Canada, France, and Finland, I love connecting with educators around the world. So this is a great opportunity to do that. And that kind of segues into 100 and what we do and how we connect with the world. So we help improve education through impactful innovations. And I'll just kind of give a brief overview of 100 and what we do. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So our vision is to transform K-12 education globally for the modern world and help every child flourish in life, no matter what happens. So that's kind of the mission of everything we do. And at the center of all that is the child. So we do that in four different ways. The first is through research by identifying innovations. And that's kind of where my core task is to look at these innovations and then help select them for our global collections or our spotlights. The second is through media. So we know that positive change is already happening in the world and we want to spread and share those success stories with everyone and 100 is our platform to do that. Three is with our community. So our community of ambassadors, innovators and funders really help innovation spread from all over the world. The idea is that our amazing things are happening, but in small little buckets, and we want to kind of amplify that. And then the fourth is through our PLUS service. So we help co-develop with educators. We really want to understand the needs of educators and then provide solutions to answer those needs. So, so just to clarify, uh, Katija, and by the way, sorry for pronouncing your name. Oh, but, that's, uh, I answered the both. Katija, uh, so, so 100 is not one startup, but it's actually 100 startups or even more. It's a network of, of entrepreneurs and innovators, uh, not just one single uh, entity or enterprise. Exactly, yeah. We are a place where a bunch of different networks can come, collaborate, need, and amplify their voice. So as you can see in this um, map, we have selected highly impactful and scalable innovations from over 100 countries. And just to give you an example of an innovation that was selected for this year's 100 2020 is Speed School from Ethiopia. So they provide a second chance at education to children who have been denied the opportunity to go to school. So I'm really interested in how reading kind of manifests within so many different innovations and is kind of the foundation level for growth. 
one thing to mention, just as we continue to learn, we continue to grow, we have a lot of education innovations published on 100.org, over a thousand, um, over a million times education innovations have been viewed, and 642 million students use education innovations listed on 100.org. So we're continuing to kind of increase our reach, increase our spread. But, but then, are these, uh, Katija, are these uh, innovations um, uh, accessible for everyone, so to speak. It's not uh, it's not owned by someone, and they have to pay a fee. Or is it actually ways of doing things right? That's a great question. So anyone, an organization, a teacher, a person can submit their innovation online, and that is ac accessible to the public. That's completely free, completely free to use our platform to access it. Of course, if you want to implement that innovation you then can contact the innovator. And I think that's one thing that's so special about 100 is that all our innovations have someone who's willing to share. So please feel free if you're interested in anything on the website, feel free to contact them and learn more. And if you are interested in learning more about 100, potentially being part of our 100 ambassador program, we'd love to have new people on board. It'd be great to have your perspective. So please feel free to find out more information on hundred.org. And that's the bit from me. I'll stop sharing my screen. There we go. Katya, you didn't answer to, to my, my, my first side question, which mm. was why libraries are so important in Finland and uh, how you come up with having so many people reading so much. Yeah, so I guess that's a great question. I. Uh, I have taught in Finland, so I, I know there's a, a, such a special relationship with reading. And also at the school level, there's a very special relationship with the textbooks that Finnish students have because they're just very well made and they're always changing and constantly updated. So I think that just the fact that reading is available everywhere and students and kids are constantly seeing it, they have role models, everywhere they look, they have these beautiful, innovative libraries. I think that naturally lends to curiosity and the willingness to kind of want to see, well, what's happening there? How can I kind of reach that? Okay, so th this takes us to um, the SOFA school and to Alinea because, um, I mean, Every time you work with learning innovation and every time you witness to an interesting innovation in education, at the core of it, there is not just technology. First of all, there is community and engagement. So um, I didn't know about the SOFA school and when Rasmus mentioned me this case history, I was very impressed. And uh, because I think by, 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 by what I have the opportunity to watch on, on, online about SOFA school in Denmark, first of all, when I, when I saw their videos, I thought, well, that's community-based learning and this is engagement. So I would like to ask them, I would like to ask to Aja and then Josephine to explain uh, how this format works and how uh, they are able to engage students in learning uh, with this innovative tool. Sure, and um, I'll start um, by presenting what Alinea is uh, in Denmark, and then I'll show a short uh, film that, that explains the tool that we use, Mentimeter, um, which is the Swedish company that we have uh, contact with. Uh, Alinea is a publisher as well here in Denmark, and we do educational material for pr primary elementary school uh, up until high school. And that's our specialty, both on the analog and the digital uh, material. And we're kind of a classical publishing uh, house, but we also try to be innovative in many other ways by creating a learning platform that is um, very uh, using multimedia to to engage students in learning, um, but in the end, um, when this uh, when this COVID uh, crisis uh, came to Denmark and the prime minister closed all the schools, uh, we had an opportunity to start Sofa School, which was an idea that came in from uh, from one of the teachers, Eslak, uh, and we quickly hired. Um, 
uh, Josefine and another teacher in to, to teach in this format. And um, the special thing about Sofa School, and if, if you don't know, it's translated into the couch school. So it's basically as it is, you can learn from your couch, um, is that it's live teaching on YouTube and um, you follow the lesson uh, with uh, this Mentimeter app or uh, in the browser and, and you engage with the, the slides that the teachers have on screen. But one of the philosophies of Sofa School is also to show uh, and to be very visual and use artifacts. Um, so I'll show the video um, instead of just talking. So here we go. Hi, my name is Josefine and I'm a teacher at the SOFA school. And my name is Aslak, I'm a teacher at the SOFA school as well. At first, when we heard about the lockdown because of the coronavirus, we thought, what did the students lose? What will they miss the most? And it's their community they have in school every day. We want the students to participate. We want the lessons to be interactive. And uh, we want to give the students a voice. And a way to do that is to use a uh, Mentimeter for the students to choose what we do in class and to like get the voices heard. The chat in a live stream is very hard to um, control. It's, it's crazy when you teach 2,000 students at one time. So we closed down the chat, but we needed the students' engagement. Mm -hmm. So we sent out polls, uh, we sent out quizzes to the students to keep them engaged. Mentimeter for me is also like a visual guiding for the kids so they know where we are, what we are talking about. And I think it's important to like, when you're speaking a lot, especially in the video lessons, there's a lot of talking and, and, and you cannot, you're not in the same room. So you need like a visual guide. And that's where I think the slideshow is perfect. When we started doing the first lesson, I was a bit afraid that this, we had to guide the students. So I planned that we had to guide the students how to go on Menti, how to um, put in the code. But what happened was before we even introduced how to do it, all the answers just arrived here. So when you are a teacher and using Mentimeter, you're, you don't have to be afraid that the students don't know how to do it. So my first advice is that you just like have to jump into it. Yeah, so um, uh, what we kind of did was to stream live on YouTube and use this Mentimeter app um, every day and it's very new for us since usually we don't do the teaching we provide the material but we couldn't do this without uh, these great teachers such as Josefine and she'll explain more about the takeaways from the concept and I'll just stop sharing my screen yes so I will just talk a little about a bit about the perspective of teaching online for up to 3,500 students we had at one day. Um, so what I want to, and hi, I'm Josefine and I've been a school teacher in Denmark for 14 years and, and now I do school development. And you're also part so, of 100, right? Yes, yes. I, I didn't contribute that much, but I want to write about the sofa school, of course. <laughs> um, so what's most important when you teach online is to follow the same rules as in the classroom. So that's my first uh, takeaways that I want to give to you guys. So if you don't know what to do online, then you just go back to what you do in, in a classroom and the age doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter if it's adults or if it's kids. So I just want to share my uh, thoughts with you. And the most important thing we did uh, at first was to create a relationship and engagement with the students. Uh, and we know we succeeded because people responded that the kids at home talked about us as their teachers. So they went like, this is my teacher. 
And I think it's impressive that you can create that relationship with students you never met. So we did it by being very personal and being very like, I'm happy to see you, welcome at school. We did like, um, um, like morning rounds where you, we talk about how you're feeling today and they answered on the phone. And we had a lot of engagement so they can, could choose what we did in the classroom, in the studio with their phones. So they chose w which words to use in a rap and how to bake a cake and stuff like that. Then we wanted the assignments for the students to be very open and creative. As we taught students at uh, three grades, and even in one grade, they are at different levels. So you need uh, the assignments to be very open and uh, creative. So you create an inclusive environment, even though it's online. So they had many possibilities to like fulfill the learning objectives and they could do the presentations in many ways. And then we didn't want to teach. We didn't want to, I don't do that in the classroom either. I don't stand at the blackboard talking for hours. But when the students cannot engage in the same room, then we had to talk a bit more than I usually do. So we wanted to make the talking a bit more inspiring and motiva motivating for the students. So we wanted to create an atmosphere where the students couldn't stop starting the assignments. So we did a lot of more effort in doing inspiring uh, environment more than teaching. So we didn't taught the students how to multiply, but we talked about why it's like uh, useful or um, great to know how to multiply. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> and we do have a, a, a webinar uh, from Mentimeter where you can like see how we do it. So we did a live webinar for adults too, so they could try how to do it. I heard that you had a dogma, uh, we're very fond of dogmas in Denmark, that every three minutes you should have an interaction of some sort with the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, you know, we, they often have their phone when they're watching something. So, so a great way of getting the students to be like engaged on even on their second screen is to, to, to use the Mentimeter uh, every like third minutes. And sometimes it was even more often, I, we had like lesson for uh, 35 minutes and we had around 40 slides, not all of them with, um, with a poll or um, opportunity to answer. But uh, yeah, I think like maybe 20 questions in, in 35 minutes. So we, we did better than th every three minutes. So well, now that, uh, before I give the floor to Eduardo, sorry, Eduardo, I just want to ask, now that the lockdown is, slowly uh, easing up or, or ending here in Denmark, will you lo use, lose all your wonderful students or do you think you can keep the community that uh, we've been talking about because it is a new way of teaching or will, you, will they go back to their schools? And we, know, we know that teachers uses the live videos and replay. Of course, it's not the same. They will usually skip the first part where we say, good morning, how are you feeling? Where are you in the country? because the Mentimeter is not available when they do it in replay. But we also started doing videos in like five, 10 minutes, uh, which is not live, but we, we use the same um, principles. We do like in relationship, inspirement, uh, motivation, teaching, of course, without the Mentimeter because it's not live. And we know a lot of students who are at home uh, because they are, have all kinds of troubles. They, they are very happy to use the Sofa Schools videos. Yeah, well, and I'm take over. Maybe, or, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Go can ahead. I just, uh, supplement that um, we've got a lot of um, messages of, uh, will you continue this, uh, especially for people who do homeschooling? They're really happy for the for the project and also we have lots of um, children with different uh, diagnoses that have trouble being in the social environments they really benefit from this format but the challenge now is when people when the students go back to school they can't be sitting alive uh, in the morning because they they are at school but definitely we try to learn from the concept and and see how can we take it further and and we can learn in many ways from teaching that way 
Excellent, thank you. Eduardo. Well, I think it's very interesting because uh, if you talk about social reading, which is what we are developing uh, with Betrill along with Pearson on the one hand, or if you talk about the SOFA school or the many innovation that Andre has developed and, and spot around the world, you, you see that uh, community is at the center of the stage and the community is key to lead the development of the project. So you, you, you build something, but then it's the community that you uh, make up that uh, leads you to new innovations. So I think this is really key, which, uh, because it puts technology on one side, but it keeps human beings at the center of the stage. And Rasmus, I think that we got some questions from the audience. Uh, we do so actually, and someone raised a hand and I didn't catch the name, but I can see a dark shadow from Moscow in one of the screens here. Privet, um, Olga, uh, um, you had a question as well. Do you wanna go and, and tell us about uh, your question to the speakers? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Really, really interesting and inspiring. Actually, now I've got two questions, uh, one about the content and another one about the format. About the content, I'm not sure that uh, our speakers are really on the topic because it's more about the educational technologies rather than the content, but I, I will, will ask. I will say really interested in your opinion. Uh, now we are launching the course for creative startups in, uh, in Moscow for people from Russia to take part in our courses. And the question is, uh, how do you think, what are the trends now in this professional education for creative startups? Is this more about uh, to develop business uh, abilities or more about the improving the idea and to find new, let's say, sources of inspiration? And the question about the format is that uh, nowadays uh, we face in Russia that more and more short and fast educational courses are appearing and they replace somehow this uh, classic standard academic uh, approach and uh, people are really willing uh, less reading as you uh, mentioned already but more watching uh, short videos uh, from lectures, more, let's say, interact uh, in the chats and blogs uh, rather than to read, let's say, big texts. And my question is, that, uh, is this the trend of uh, this crisis period or it will, uh, let's say, when, when people want to get this fast information or it is more about the changing of the format in general of education approach? Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Uh, maybe I can answer the first part of the content and then the rest of you can consider answering whether uh, what we're doing right now, what we're doing really right now, a webinar, is that going to go away once we all are back in the streets and hugging each other and kissing? Um, so, uh, but I will start on the content part. Uh, if we believe that startups from the cultural and creative industries are different than many other startups and there are some economic properties and some ways that in many ways they are different. I think you also need to construct a different course. You can't just give them a regular uh, lean canvas business, whatever course. Uh, you probably need to add some other uh, elements since many of the startups in the culture and creative industries uh, uh, are building on, on trends and also on have the double unknown. You don't really know what will work and you don't really know your product before you actually have it out there. Uh, you can't plan everything. So uh, there's a lot of, 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 of knowing where the society is going when you uh, plan uh, uh, an educational program for startups in, that, in this field, which I hope I understood your question correctly. And then maybe one of you can answer, is this just temporary that we're all doing Metameter and Kahoot and uh, being on webinars? Anyone? Eduardo, maybe? Well, uh, I think we, we had many interesting questions. I, I, I would just say that, that uh, this crisis is accelerating some trends. So what we know is that old style school did not work before and cannot work today. So I think it is really interesting that uh, large groups such Pearson and small startups and innovations are gathering to build the future of education technology. I think Katya, for instance, has a very well, um, uh, I mean, she, she, she's, she's positioned in a, she's in a position to witness many is innovation popping up 
and, and spreading across the world. But I'm also interested in Elena's opinion because she, she is able to, to, to depict how a large group can intervene in such a difficult context as EdTech. Just to add to your point, and I don't know if this completely touches the question, but one thing that I think will happen and that we just worked on a spotlight on coronavirus with um, the OECD and a point that Andreas Leiker came up with was that students now are in the power to make more decisions. So they're going to go back into the classroom being a lot more um, knowing what works for them because they've had that opportunity to kind of create that personalized learning for themselves. So you'll see these students who are demanding a lot more because they know what works and they've had that chance to explore that during this time. Yeah, Elena, would you like to add something up yes, on this? Yes, yes. Um, so my perspective is the, is the perspective of uh, a publisher. So someone that uh, uh, provide the traditional contents in the past to the school. We have also uh, a new, um, uh, a new objective that is developing ed tech, but uh, we still see both the sides. And so my opinion is that the new context uh, imposed by COVID-19 is changing the way people use the digital tools we have designed so far. Uh, because we designed the tools uh, uh, till now, uh, both for classroom use and for homework. But uh, the distance learning model uh, that can be full or blended also in the next future, changes, uh, in my opinion, uh, the metacognitive learning process. So now what we need, uh, I think, uh, is uh, uh, to rethink didactic models uh, and content frameworks, uh, as the SOFA experience uh, uh, is saying us. Uh, I think that uh, from a content point of view, to, to answer to the Russian question, we will need new contents and technology, uh, effective and user-friendly, for the end users. So this is a point. And then there are a lot of other points for the ed tech. So it's not just about content, but it is, uh, it is about uh, the process of learning and uh, working in the school. Uh, let's think, for instance, to evaluation process. The evaluation process too is changing. Uh, in our experience, the teacher had so far based assessment on physical observation of the student uh, plus uh, results. But uh, uh, now the, 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 the physical assessment is failing. Uh, or, um, so I think also in a blended learning model, we will need to think to a different model of assessment. Uh, another crucial point I think is uh, the content for the teacher because teacher training is crucial. So um, I think that there are a lot of points uh, about content uh, and a lot of opportunity. Yes, uh, because at the end uh, for the EdTech company, the question is, uh, is this an opportunity? Yes. But at the same time, uh, we have a challenge uh, because there is uh, also um, to be considered the fact that uh, the digital, yes, we are in, an in a digital context, uh, this is true, but the digital uh, literacy skills uh, of students and teachers are not so well developed. So another uh, important challenge is uh, uh, to create, uh, to propose to the school uh, and to the educational system a way in which uh, uh, this capability of using digital can be enabled. Uh, I think another point that we didn't cover, but it's important about content uh, is the capability uh, we still need uh, to support also parents. In these homeschooling models, anyone speak about parents, but parents are doing a lot. And uh, I think uh, uh, we need to support also them that are supporting their children, in particularly children uh, uh, under the, the age of 13, I think. Um, and we need to support teachers in communicating with parents, uh, giving them effective tools. So, a lot of things to do, in my yeah. opinion. Mm -hmm. Elena, have, you mentioned... Thank you. We have about 10 minutes left, and if there's someone in the audience that have a question, you, are, you can raise your hand, but it would actually be good if you could write, write your question in the chat. And uh, if you're too shy, uh, one of us can read it up. Uh, or, um, or you can actually ask it yourself by raising your hand. And I just want to say, was it Sunil Kuchal that I saw raising his hand briefly? Uh, it disappeared from my screen. If it was, please uh, write down uh, your question or raise your hand again if it was you. But, yeah, uh, we, yeah, we also have a question from Maria Bucher. Uh, I think Maria is from Yemen. 
as I met her before. And uh, Maria asked, uh, do you advise to hire teachers to join our team or more insight, for more insights? Well, uh, I think this is an interesting point. It's not, it's not, uh, it not happened by chance, I think, that uh, uh, Josephine and Anna and Anya came up with uh, Sofa School. And Josephine said, I am a teacher. So that's what I'm witnessing everywhere. Most of the innovation in education come from teachers. Because teachers have the fundamental uh, knowledge, pedagogy. If you have a passion for pedagogy, you know what works and you use technology properly. So yes, I think that you need teachers to, to bring innovations in schools. And I, I don't know if you all agree about that. I completely agree. I think what's been so fascinating is how effective and quickly change has happened because of teachers. It seems like overnight teachers have adapted quicker than anyone else and been able to kind of continue that education in their classrooms. So I see it happening all around the world, these groups of teachers that are able to adapt and um, yeah, meet the needs of their kids. I think one thing that will be interesting as we move forward is how maybe these networks in different countries communicate and share with each other, because that's one thing that I haven't seen as much, but I look forward to that. Let me see if there's another question here. For countries like Nepal, who are in a developing phase where internet itself is a challenge, what do you suggest in carrying on education, on educating children? Uh, so I actually also thought of that earlier when we talked about digital skills uh, um, and inclusion also. Are you poor if you don't have an iPhone? Uh, uh, that's something we've been debating in Denmark actually, uh, or being excluded. But also here we have a question from from Nepal, uh, any of the experts that would like to answer, what do you do if you, there is no internet? Uh, I, I'd like to answer because uh, uh, the, this situation, uh, thanks uh, for this question, uh, is not just in Nepal, it's also in Italy. Hmm? In the current lockdown, primary school are not using digital so, ma so much because uh, we have a lot of digital divide among families. Hmm? And uh, so I think that, uh, Digital can enable, but uh, we still need to pay a lot of attention to digital divide. What is changing is not just digital. Digital is just a tool, in my opinion. What is changing is the didactical approach. So the methodology that teachers can use to really enable each student to learn. This is uh, what uh, I think, uh, as also the experience of Josephine, for instance, is uh, showing us, is the way she teach, not just the digital uh, tool. And so I think that uh, to teach children in Nepal or in any other countries, what we need uh, is uh, to build uh, uh, with a community-based experience, in particular regarding teachers, uh, the capability of uh, being more effective in teaching, being more inclusive, and uh, when possible, start to use technology. And I can add that in, in because I talk with other countries, uh, for example, Peru about this, in Denmark, in fact, the national broadcast company did broadcast the YouTube uh, live signal. So people were able to watch it on the television. So if you're not able to watch it on YouTube, there might be a possibility to stream it or broadcast it on television. And I was thinking the first thing that Eduardo actually told us was, we need to read books and we need to read and uh, because that will, and we need to develop our literary skills, our digital skills, but uh, we need to become, we become citizens uh, by reading. Uh, maybe we should go back to the basics of the webinar a little bit and, uh, and discuss that. Uh, if we don't learn to read and if we don't read, and uh, you said it's a very social uh, activity to read, Sometimes it's also sitting in a corner by yourself and, and, and disappearing into a universe uh, someone has created for you. Uh, so what's, what's the rule of, of the book and reading the book in, in, in education, but also in, 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 in becoming educated, in becoming a, a citizen? Either of you. <laughs> 
well, I, I can start, but just because I work in the publishing industry, so probably I'm, I think that it's my, my duty to answer. So I think uh, in general, reading and uh, be educated, so the education process in books is part of this, uh, improve, is a way in which we improve uh, our lives, the lives of people through learning. So it's really uh, the only way I think we have uh, for uh, um, developing uh, uh, a new citizenship. So reading uh, is uh, something uh, that uh, um, we should uh, uh, enable in all the students. Reading, it doesn't mean just read. It also means uh, to be able to listen to a text. Let's think we didn't spoke, speak about uh, special needs students, but we have a lot of problems. And I think uh, all the colleagues can uh, testify this uh, with the special needs students. Uh, uh, what does it mean today to enable also the students uh, to read a text, uh, to be able to develop digital literacy skills? It means uh, to give them the tools, uh, and digital can support these, uh, uh, to access the content of a book. Mm -hmm. So audio book, uh, audio synthesis, all these kind of tools that can enable the, in, a, in a new app for reading, uh, can, can, sorry, can, can be uh, inserted, can enable this kind of process. So in my opinion, uh, it's a real a challenge that uh, we should uh, all uh, uh, consider. Thank you, Irina. Uh, Lita, uh, do you have a question I can see in the chat? Do you want to um, read it out yourself or t uh, tell us about it? I can't really see where you are right now. Yeah, you're right there. Hey, Irina. good morning. Good no, morning. you won't see me. Sorry, guys. I, 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 I am not ready to be seen yet. <laughs> are you calling, if I remember correctly, you're calling from Latvia, right? Yes, yes, I'm from Latvia, and as I wrote, I'm working with the students, but uh, the subject which you, which you introduced, it's very interesting, as we really, we are having a problem with uh, working with the students at, with universities when giving assignment, like reading a lot, and then making a short abstract and presentation. They have a problem to observe that information, like it just was said by some of the colleagues. So the reading in an elementary school, in a secondary school, high school, it must, must have, because are forcing or, or, or like motivating kids to read. So that is an issue. And it could be very difficult uh, to, to correct it uh, in, a, in a university already. But thanks for a discussion, yep. Thank you, Lenita. Uh, I think we're, uh, we're also, we have four minutes left, so it, maybe it's about time to wrap up. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask uh, our, uh, our speakers, our presenters today, if they have any last takeaways they want to make sure to give to our audience. I can tell you that we will actually uh, make a short summary uh, of, the, of, the different, of what we've been talking about this morning. Uh, and we'll also provide some links uh, that uh, our speakers have provided, so uh, you will uh, you will be sent that uh, uh, later on. Uh, but uh, any uh, last minute takeaways from the speakers? Otherwise, I have some. Well, my my only message is just guys buy and borrow books because the more books you have in a house, the more likely it is that your children are going to read more, and the more they take you. They take, you take them to libraries, the more they will read. So it's interesting that the, the company that is selling us anything today is a company that started selling books online. <laughs> so just buy books and possibly in an old library and help librarians as well. That's my message. Thank you, Eduardo. Katia, Josephine, Elena, and Aya, any last minute takeaways? I mean, this has been really great for me. I look at a lot of innovation. So just to kind of focus on that fundamental reading aspect of the different innovations and how that's fostered, I'm kind of taking that away in my own work. So thank you very much for everyone sharing. Josephine, Elena, no? Then I think uh, I can briefly wrap up that it's, uh, it's been a, a really good uh, seminar on uh, webinar on, on reading and learning. We've been taught that uh, reading should be a pleasure and an exciting activity and we should connect books and education to the digital opportunities. Reading is becoming a social experience, reading off my notes here. Uh, and also there are new tools, new innovative tools to activate the motivation from students. And I think all of our speakers uh, emphasized 
the community building around uh, reading and about learning uh, that we learn together with others and we become who we are by, uh, by reading and by interacting with others around the books. Let me just see, I see there are four messages in the chat that I just want to check, or oh, these are just thank yous. Um, I don't think we have time for that. We have two minutes left. I see uh, Diego is shaking his head, so we should probably wrap up. Then I would like to say thank you to our uh, fantastic speakers. This is way too short an hour. Uh, we have to touch on this subject again, and we'll do so uh, end of June for the Bright Week. There will be a series of webinars, including about around uh, reading and learning and playing and learning, etc. Today we heard Eduardo Montenegro from Bedwell. I can, rec I can recommend go to go to the App Store and download uh, the Bedwell app. Uh, there is Elena Bonifaci from Pearson, one of the most innovative companies in the world, uh, according to Fast Company, that's, and, uh, that's a reliable source. We have Katija, uh, <laughs> I'm not getting it right, uh, Aladdin, that's much easier, from 100, this really good network of ed tech startups and, and ambassadors wanting to uh, innovate in education. And then we have from um, uh, Alinea, Ayaru Honko, and also associated with the, the SOFA school, we have uh, Josephine Jack Ivy. Um, they will be, uh, you, we will share their contact information, at least their LinkedIn uh, profiles in the, in the summary of this, um, of this webinar. There are new webinars every Wednesday, uh, starting uh, two a week, uh, starting from Wednesday the 20th. They will also, thanks to the rebellious Latin Americans, and Diego is one of them, there will be some uh, special uh, editions happening throughout the week uh, as of next week. Uh, I believe the first one is going to be on social inclusion, and we'll let the Latin Americans decide when it should be, but it will be in the afternoon, so they don't have to get up in the middle of the night. The world is round. We can actually confirm that by these webinars. It is round and not flat. Thank you, everyone. Hope Thank you enjoyed you. it. And I hope to see you again. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye-bye.